here. We're gonna get going here. So everybody, why don't you see so that size in New York? What's that? Oh, you take this one right here. Yes, thanks. So, so Jake, have you been on the Rowan campus before? I have been on the Rowan campus before. My sister graduated from Rowan, um, and I think I have been to a Rowan football game at some point, but not for a while. Not for a while. No. Um, so, let's go back to your college days. Um, when you went to Penn, did you play football at Penn? No. You did not? No, I played club baseball, but... Club baseball. Football, yeah. So, when... Take me through the, uh, the economics, international relations. Yeah. What was that all about? Uh, I would say that that's, um, like you said, I really had not a clear picture of exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I knew I desperately wanted to go to Penn at the time. I applied early. I had some um, cousins that had went that had gone there. And so I was very focused on going to Penn. I was a lot less focused on what I was going to study or what I was going to do professionally. Um, I was disproportionately obsessed with how much money I was going to make in a career. And that's what, as a, a kid, um, I think I was a little misguided and didn't quite understand um, a lot of the things that ultimately I understand now about your career. Um, but economics and international relations for me were within the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, were, you know, economics was more of a business-ish degree within an arts and science program. Um, international relations, I don't really know why I did that at all. <laughs> because I would say this too, there was a foreign language um, requirement at Penn and it was not based on time or number of credits. It was based on proficiency. And that was the most fearful of anything I've ever been because I was not proficient. I took French like seventh grade, eighth grade, all through high school and then two years in college. And I was not good in foreign language. And so it took me a couple of tries, quite frankly, to pass my proficiency test. Um, I don't know, foreign language and I don't agree. But um, yeah, I just sort of, I got through school, had these, these degrees and as I was thinking about a career, I really was not very focused on what I wanted to do. So when did that change? So when did you realize, all right, well, first of all, your background yeah. is interesting. Yeah, so, it, so take them through uh -huh. a little bit of your, your career path to how you got to where you are today. Sure. Um, my career path is very um, atypical in the sense that I have pivoted multiple times and very significant pivots. So I think maybe there's a lesson to be taken from that when whatever your first job is or whatever it is that you think you want to do professionally, by no means are you locked into that. You know, like never feel like you can't go back, never feel like you can't change if it doesn't line up with what you want to be doing. Um, but out of Penn, I took a job with a consulting firm. Um, there was a significant amount of travel involved um, and, you know, it, it felt like a good thing to do out of school. Um, I did that for two years and then I was on a long-term project in Chicago and someone I knew worked on a trading floor, um, at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So lunch one day I walked over, went down on the trading floor and I was like blown away. I had no idea that people did something like that for a living. It was literally like playing a sport for a job. People were, you know, were down there wearing like collared shirts and khakis. They looked like, you know, at, at the time this goes back a little bit, but people were not, didn't dress nearly as casually for work. So to see people working in that way, it was so casual and, um, there was just these guys were like making significant amounts of money. It was like, it was just, it was like playing a sport. So I was, I was hooked. I quit my consulting job with Deloitte Consulting, like within days. I took a job um, clerking for an options group at the Chicago Board Options Exchange. Um, and then six months later, I borrowed some money, leased a seat at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and just started trading 
my own account that way. So took the plunge um, and then traded different products, different situations, some on the floor, then some off the floor electronically and did that for like the next 13 years of my life. Um, we moved, I was in Chicago for the most part, moved back east um, and then I was still trading and was already thinking like trading for me was always a means to an end. I was not like my passion in life. First thing I did every morning from the time I was little until all the way up was check what went on in sports the night before, look at scores. I mean, hard to imagine now, but there was a newspaper involved at some point, like to figure out what the scores were, look at box scores from the day before. That was always my passion, like nothing a close second to sports. Um, but I would say like it, that part of my life from college um, and then the early stage of my professional career, I had no idea how to work in sports or that that was even like a real thing. I mean, I never really took the time, never had anyone sit and explain to me that you can sort of marry your passion and your profession, which seems like a relatively simple concept, like do what you love. But I don't know, my dad worked at an insurance company or reinsurance company. He commuted into New York from where, where we grew up, took a bus every day back and forth. I don't know, it just seemed like a job like everyone else had. I don't think he was like super passionate about insurance. And, you know, at no point, either my high school advisor or college advisor, maybe our conversations, you know, never led in that path, but they never said like, hey, instead of settling and going to work in consulting or whatever, like most of your peers, if sports is a thing that you're most passionate about, why don't you try to do that? But anyway, it took me a while to sort of figure all that out. Um, and then we were living, I'd say in North Jersey, I was working in New York and I had an opportunity um, to take an internship. Basically there was, you know, some intermediate steps in between, but to take an internship again, to pivot out of trading and work in sports. Um, and so I started um, commuting from where we lived down to Philly um, to work for the Eagles and commuted 83 miles each way for 11 months. Um, you know, my daughter who's sitting right here was a little baby at that point. And, you know, the hours and days and things in this career are lengthy. And so, you know, in order to be at work and sitting at my desk by 7 a.m. every morning and you know, get the hour and a half commute. I was leaving the house early. I was home late. So it would be like, you know, Sunday night, see you on Friday, Friday night. And it was aggressive, but necessary at that point, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Um, and so that slide said, I'm entering my 12th season. That is now over that season, thankfully, miserably. And um, so I finished my 12th season. Um, yeah. All right. So that kind of gives you an idea of the background. Uh, there's lots of questions I could ask, but I'll, I'll really leave them for you guys to be able to ask the questions about what intrigues you most about what Jake has done over the course of his career. Cause that is a totally different path than what he probably thought he was going to do when he left the university of Pennsylvania. Sean, I know you want to go with the first question. So ask an Eagle executive with a giant hat and sweatshirt on what question you got. Uh, well, on March 12th, I did the exact same thing, went to MetLife Stadium, and it was a, it was a long ride, three buses down there, didn't get Back to one o'clock in the morning. Didn't get the job, but oh, okay. But how um, did how did you guys get Saquon? And how somebody 
as calm as Saquon? How do you teach that? So you knew he was going to ask about Saquon. Saquon. You knew that. The minute you saw him coming to the door, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, what I mean, what's the question as far as how, how did we you get Saquon? How did you get Saquon? Well, it's funny you mentioned that. Um, the NFL has, you know, with with players that are going to be free agents from other teams, the NFL has a two day period where you're allowed to engage in conversations with their agents and talk about parameters for a deal and literally come to a deal, just not execute the deal. Um, so those conversations, you know, it, it starts at 12 o'clock on that Monday, whatever day that was. Um, and, you know, you gotta be aggressive. You have all this stuff. You've spent a lot of time um, planning, thinking about players, which players you want to do, what you'd be willing to spend for certain players, um, and trying to get a sense of, you know, what it's going to take to sign them. The agents that represent these players, um, by and large, uh, you know, there are a lot of agents. Um, most of the agents have very few, if any, players. And, you know, the players, by and large, are concentrated amongst a, a group of agents that we deal with all the time so it's yeah i mean getting a deal done is really um it's not as complicated or time consuming as some people might think in a situation like that right in the beginning of free agency you're not doing a super complicated deal with all kinds of permutations um you know when we do extensions with our own players we're looking at comps we're looking at you know, data about similar players. There's a lot more involved. It takes a long time. We go back and forth. You know, sometimes we start further apart. Um, but when it comes to free agency, it's all got to happen real, real quick, where you lose opportunities and yeah, the other deals are simple. All right, Greg, go ahead. And congratulations. What's say, that? Say congratulations. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. When you're in the process of negotiating with contracts with different players and like agents and stuff, what are the arguments like when you get into that situation that if a player feels like they're worth an extra year and you guys don't want to go that extra year, mm -hmm. what is that process like? Well, taking one step back, and I'm, I don't want to focus on the length, um, but it's important to kind of note in the NFL, deals are not by nature guaranteed, right? So unlike in baseball or basketball, though there's permutations of basketball too, but we'll stick with baseball. You know, when a player signs a five-year, $100 million deal in baseball, come hell or high water, they're going to get the $100 million. Even if they don't live up to their end of the bargain, they're not a good player, things like that. If it doesn't work, they're still going to get the money. Um, in the NFL, our deals are, are not guaranteed unless they're explicitly guaranteed. So a matter of length, like we're almost always going to want to take to get an extra year or whatever because that we're not talking about guaranteed years when it, it comes to that so if you think about it like in financial terms it more or less is a team option on a player right if you have an unguaranteed year you're heading into that season and we'll kind of carry the same we'll carry an example forward where let's say you're paying a player $10 million this upcoming season. If you're looking at it and he's really comparable to players who are making $15 million, <clears throat> we're going to keep the player. If you're looking at him in that situation and he's really comparable to players who are making $5 million, you're not going to keep the player on that deal. So extra years by and large are beneficial to, to the team. There's a few extra considerations, but it's not you know, very, very different. Baseball fighting over term makes a lot of sense for us. Generally, players are fighting for shorter deals. You know, players want a chance to hit the market again, and they understand the dynamics that if it's not guaranteed, the only way that they're going to be kept at that number is more than likely not going to benefit them. It's because they're worth more. So I think that consideration is important. Um, yeah. You're mentioning 10 million, 15 million, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, and the numbers that you're dealing with are astronomical. Mm -hmm. Do you ever sit back and go, this is crazy? 
You ever, you ever think that to yourself? Yeah, I, I, yes and no. I mean, yes, it's, it's crazy to a certain, to, it's like anything else. When you get used to it and that's what you deal with every day, it becomes a little bit of second nature and there's not as much like, holy crap, you know, what is it like this, you know, what's it like for this guy who's making whatever the number is. I don't really think about it as much like that. I just, you know, I'd liken it to not now, but in the days where I would like play poker or go to a casino or something and you're sitting there with a pile of chips, like at a certain point, you're just playing the game, whether the chips are $5, $10, $25 or $100 chips, kind of irrespective, it doesn't change how you play. And I think you just become the currency that we deal with is probably units, you know, millions of dollars. And so we just roll, everything is sort of on that scale, but not sitting there like, you know, dumbfounded by the size of the deal. I mean, there are times, I mean, we did Jalen's deal last spring and I guess, you know, sitting there like, uh, like that's a big number, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Um, and, you know, as well as I know him and just thinking about like trying to put yourself in that spot, like one day you have this, the next day, you know, you have this. That's that's pretty incredible just to think about and the impact that has on someone's life and then multiple generations, hopefully, and things like that. But, you know, you're, you're not, yeah, I think you just get numb to it at a certain point. I, I like your word, <laughs> units. Yeah, just you just it. use units. Do units. Like, Don't use dollars, yeah. use units. Yeah. He's gonna get a bunch of units. All right, uh, George, go ahead. Was Saquon always on the Eagles' radar knowing what his market price was with the Giants offered him last year, or was DeAndre Swift originally a long-term plan in the running back position? The Panera jersey's throwing me off. Yeah, I'm a Giants fan. I, uh, so, uh, I was a Giants fan until I wasn't, until I started here. So in full disclosure, I am a Rangers fan still. Um, so, yeah, the Panera jersey, I like the Giants thing. Um, so we'll put it this way. Like, you know, we do a lot of work on free agency independent of, we don't know who's going to sign back with their own team, you know, and, and how things are going to materialize. Like we're looking sometimes, you know, we might be thinking about extending one of our own players who might be a free agent next year. We're already looking at who's going to be free agents next year. What's that market going to be like? What are the comps for this player if we let them play it out? You know, are we better off getting ahead of a few other players at the same position who may do deals, things like that? Um, and so, you know, in this case of Saquon, he was franchised last year. There was a lot of back and forth about whether he would be franchised their quarterback or not. Um, and so, it's almost like you go through the exercise two years in a row, the same exercise, you know? So last year we had to all the way up until um, the Giants got a, a deal done for Dana Jones and they franchise Saquon. We had to proceed like he was going to be a free agent until he wasn't. So we, we went through that. It was like a, you know, fire drill. Um, and then when you, you go through that, and a player is on a franchise deal and you know it's just a one-year deal, like you have the entire year and summer and the season and stuff, you're looking at players with a little bit of a different lens knowing that they're gonna hit the market potentially. Like the entire season long, um, we use like these flip cards for every game where impending unrestricted free agents, restricted free agents, potential cap cuts, those are all highlighted. So, you know, when we're, sitting there in pregame and we're watching the other team warm up or something like we know who to sort of keep an extra eye on who might be, you know, on the market in the spring. Um, so yeah. And then when it comes to what the market is and how much you're going to pay, like, I feel like, um, we do, we have a really comprehensive process and I'm a markets person, you know, I have trading experience, sense of trading experience. I've always been fascinated by markets. Um, and so one of the, the parts of this job in terms of being good at it, there's a, a football component, like understanding the actual game and understanding 
what makes, um, what the nuances are and what distinguish great players from good players, from, you know, replaceable players. Like you need to know that if you're going to be good at this job and you're going to effectively um, prepare arguments and um, negotiate. But, you know, you're, you're basically like going through this exercise where you have a pretty good sense of what similar players at that age of that ability in that position, you know, what it's going to, what a deal is going to look like. And then we have this tampering period, which goes fast, but it also is a little bit of like price discovery where you can go, you can call like a, you know, a whole range of players and get a sense. So yeah, I don't know. Hopefully that answered your question. I saw a lot of stuff, but yeah. All right. Uh, let's go right here. Justin. Um, I know NFL drafted like one of the most stressful days for like the head of operations and football team. So how do you guys prepare for it? And how do you guys keep your emotions in check? For on draft day? Yeah. Well, dra it's actually three days. And I would say, I don't know if I think about draft as being like the most stressful in terms of um, the fact of the matter is like, we're all sort of hunkered down in a room. We have every resource at our disposal. Um, you know, I think there's a lesson in life and, you know, if you've, and I say this to my son's a sophomore in high school, and I say this all the time, like if, if you've done a good job studying, you know, he studied until he can't get it wrong, not just until he's getting problems right. And I think the amount of work that goes into the draft ahead of time is like, you can't even comprehend the number of people and the amount of work and the level of detail that goes into it on so many different levels, you know, whether it's background, whether it's, um, you know, the mental state of the player, whether it's behavioral stuff. We've talked to like every person who has had contact with that player at college, you know, strength coach, position coaches. We have, you know, there's always people um, who know extra people at the school, whether it's advisors or um, RAs, like when it matters, we will get to the right people who will give an honest opinion about a player and how he treats people and anything that's happened in school. So. I think the lesson is like, once we get into the draft, I don't know that it's like one of the craziest days necessarily because some of it's outside your control. You're just waiting for, you know, players to sort of go. We have a 22nd pick this year. So we'll by and large be waiting. Um, you're kind of constantly evaluating, but we've gone through all these scenarios. We've talked about the players. We've got every piece of information we could possibly need about a player. Um, <coughs> And, you know, I think it's the crazy part, to be totally honest with you about the, the draft, is the third day, the last day of the draft, and when we get to undrafted free agency, that is a, yeah, I must, I swear a lot. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, like, I have words coming into, like, that literally on the tip of my tongue, and I'm like, eh, hey, I probably shouldn't say that in my classroom. Um, yeah, like, that is, that's frenetic. Like, that takes me back to, like, being on a trading floor, or uh, whatever. And so this is an example of like, I'm not numb to the fact that even in the midst of that process, when we're sitting there screaming back and forth and we're trying to fill a spot, uh, you know, we may be trying to sign a receiver, or maybe we're trying to sign a million different positions at once. And we're negotiating it in that sense, not over millions of dollars. At times we're like down to like a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars. And you know, we objectify in terms of all right, we need to fill a spot, we want this player. The reality that whether we come to an agreement right here in the next 30 seconds or not determines where this player is gonna start his NFL career, is potentially gonna um, you know, where this player is gonna live. If it works out, this player is going to have like a positive impact on our team and franchise all based on this call with an agent that just took 30 seconds or it's that is a little bit staggering at times. And, you know, I would say like in the in the NFL, depending on the positions, um, it's unique in the sense that situations, schemes, um, coaches 
there's so many different things that impact whether a player is going to have success um, on that team. And the margins between a player, you know, you may have two players who have like the identical skill set, you know, and one player becomes like a 10 year perennial, you know, starter um, and makes a ton of money in the league. And the other player basically like bounces around and has like more or less no career to speak of. The, the difference might wind up being one player went to a team first that fit what he does really well, had a coach who took an interest, had a coach who was able to develop him, um, and the other player just went to you know, a scheme that didn't fit his skill set. Maybe he had a jerk, I wouldn't use the word jerk, as a coach. Like, whatever the case may be, and he washed out, and he's like, oh, I wasn't good enough to play in the NFL. Well, you know, and so those kinds of things are a little bit staggering and, and amazing. And it also, um, you know, lends itself to opportunity when you're looking for players and you're trying to build a roster because not having success in a particular in one team doesn't mean that your skill set or your ability isn't conducive to having success in the league. You just may not have been in the right situation yet. Um, yes. So I think, you know, that there's a important part of the job and mainly this falls on Howie typically in terms of communicating, you know, managing up is part of most jobs, you know, depends on what your level of responsibility is, but sometimes you're managing up and sometimes you're managing down. Um, but keeping ownership involved in it, and I only know um, what happens here in Philly. You know, every team is a little bit different. Other ownership may handle, other ownership and GMs may handle things completely differently. But in our case, um, we definitely want <clears throat> buy-in. I mean, our ownership wants to win first, foremost, and otherwise, like that is the driver to every single thing we do. Um, but I think that you know, Jeffrey gives us every resource we possibly need to put a good team on the field. And that's really all that matters. Um, but he also has been doing this for a long time and has good opinions and, you know, will ask sort of the, the right questions or a provocative question to make sure that the way that we're thinking about this, we've considered everything because um, I'm sure that there's decisions you've made in your life where they may not have, have worked out or they may have been the wrong decision. And you realize you were so focused on choosing what you did that you just totally like blocked out. There was a lot of other information that may have prevented you from making a mistake, but you know, you had this bias towards I'm going to do this. Um, and I think the goal here is to make sure that we consider everything. You know, we may feel like a player is going to help us. There may be a controversial background, whatever the case may be. And it's just make sure you're weighing all that, you know, ahead of time, because once once we've drafted the player, signed the player, you know, he's ours. And whether he succeeds or fails, that's on us. And we look at it that way. And the staff, everybody looks at it that way. Um, you know, I think we have a, a very unique approach to player development, um, particularly relative to the NFL broadly. It's not people would say that the NFL is not a very player development friendly sport. You just, the, the rules um, that govern how much time the players can spend in the building, you know, how much on field time, how much contact, all those things really make it difficult to make better football players. You know, players get better during the season to some extent through practice and playing. Um, but we're, we have, um, 53 players on an active roster. We have 16 or 17 players on a practice squad. We have players who are on injured reserve who can come back and play during the season. Um, but we're having outside of the three preseason games and some padded practices during training camp where there's contact, hardly ever tackling to the ground. Like there are very few opportunities to actually play football, you know, and then when a player when the season ends, there's, um, you know, a spring league, but players that are under contract to the NFL don't have the ability to play in the spring league. There are no opportunities for them to play football, 
right? So how do you get better? You know, at, like look at the NBA. NBA off season, players go out to LA, players go wherever, and they run pickup games with the best players. You know, they are just, how do you get better at basketball? You play basketball. How do you get better at football? Well, you can't play football. So it's, it's a difficult kind of quandary there. Um, but we have a, a legitimate player development program where we have full-time people who work there, Connor Barwin, who played for us, um, who's a good friend of mine. He runs our player development program and we, they, we make a concerted effort into making sure that even over the course of the season where our primary focus is preparing for each week's game and just winning that game, um, where there is a alternative focus on you know, practice squad and the five players or whatever the number is that are on active roster also who just aren't getting many reps and making sure that you know that process hasn't stopped with them in terms of getting better um, because it's a violent violent league and players get hurt all the time and you know we may be sitting there thinking it's a luxury that someone's working with you know a backup backup offensive lineman in September and then by November that backup backup offensive lineman is playing, you know, and he's starting on, on a Sunday. So you don't know that that's going to pay off. And there's a lot of like player movement, even during a season after a season. So we may spend a lot of time with a player who winds up moving on to another team. Um, but we tell our players when they come in, our goal is to improve you to where you help us on the field or, you know, you help someone else um, and, you know, you have a career. And I think that's really um, a great thing about our organization is, you know, we do spend a lot of time, effort, money um, into trying to develop them as players, people, kind of the whole, the whole gamut. Davion. So I know that you're probably, not probably, I know you're, you're a man of, of many, many talents, but you have many jobs, you know, that you go on to, you know, go on through your day working with different people. But I want to ask, what is like your main job that you that you focus on the most when you go into work every day? And then another question to that is, what is one of the most challenging parts of your job? Yeah. Um, I mean, my main responsibility has been just overseeing, you know, salary cap and the financial aspects of the football team. Um, but I think over time, um, how much time I've spent like in the weeds, in the real detailed side of things has changed and evolved. Um, even as a change of career person, you know, in my mid thirties, when I started in the NFL, I had to do like that, the real detail in the weeds stuff, which was a struggle for me to be quite frank. Like, you know, when you, your career is progressing in another field and then you pivot more often than not, you're going back to the, the bottom and starting over. So readjusting from a mindset standpoint was tough. Um, but I did very detail oriented stuff when I first started in terms of, um, the way that we like manage the cap, we did a lot of stuff in Excel, whereas now we've we have like a proprietary scouting system that is unbelievable and has like all this stuff sort of wrapped into it. Um, so I do far less of the minute to minute, like in the weed stuff and try to focus a little bit more on like bigger picture strategic stuff. Um, and yeah, that's always um, an interesting thing for me is always trying to learn and progress. And, you know, this is not a business necessarily where you have a lot of control over how you progress because there's only 32 teams, you know? So I could be the greatest at my job on earth, which means the greatest out of 32. If nobody sees me as worthy or um, desirable to hire to be a GM and run a team, like where do my skills, you know, how do I sort of translate those skills into continuing to grow and move up? And I think that's, that's a challenge. That's something I think about like all the time now, because I've been in this, I've been doing this a long time. Um, and that's really the only step for me 
would be probably to run a team. I mean, there's some like intermediate or sideways, but you know, when you have a family and a life, it's the coaching life. And a lot of these people I've worked with for the last 13 years is a, by nature, like a migrant life. They, a lot of them, spouses, kids are just used to like packing their stuff and, and just like on a minute's notice, a drop of a hat, either they've been fired, they got a promotion, they're like moving constantly. And it is wild, you know, as a kid, depending on what game I was watching, I would be screaming about whomever should be fired, like constantly. No knowledge that that's actually like a person, a family, and what the the repercussions would be of that. Having seen the other side, like it's it's crazy how fast these things. I mean, you know, we were ten and one, and we went one and six at the end of the season, and that had an awful, awful like impact, obviously on all our fans and everything else, but real people's lives who eight weeks earlier were like, Shh, we're going to Super Bowl, you know? And then two months later, it's not the Super Bowl and they're trying to find another job. Like that's crazy um, and awful, you know, at the same, in the same thing. Um, and then you asked like, what's the worst part of my job? Well, I guess that's part of the worst part is seeing people that you know and have gotten close with and you know, you know that they're family now. They're they're moving, and um, but the worst part of my job, um, I would say, is like it depends on the particular job. But a lot of jobs, whether you're good or bad at your job, is a, there's a very clear like scorecard, like. Um, you know, I'd say I'll com contrast it to when I traded, you know, in the markets. If I made money, great. Lost money, bad. Clear, you know, am I good at my job? Like if I'm losing money every day, I could tell people I'm good at my job, but I'm not. What we do, we could be unbelievably great at our jobs and the results are terrible, right? Because this is a human, you know, we are basically, this isn't a science, this is an art. We're compiling a group of humans, putting them through this like grueling test that lasts more or less six months. You have no idea at the end of it, who's gonna be left from your original group because of health. You don't know how they're gonna to relate to one another, which is a huge part of the game. Um, and so the hardest part is that you could do your job at times exceptionally well, or even you could do your job exceptionally poorly and the results can be completely detached from that. And I think that's like a hard, that's a hard thing. You know, like in my role, you're highly dependent on the general manager, right? If you work for a GM who's not very good in terms of picking players um, and doing the job as a whole, like your ability to succeed is pretty capped. Right. Like you could be phenomenal at your job working for someone who's making terrible decisions and who knows that you're good at your job and vice versa. You could be terrible at your job and your GM is just so good and he's just basically dragging you along for the ride and people look at you and be like, man, you're unbelievable. And so like that's a weird that is a weird thing. And then, you know, the hiring process in the NFL, there really aren't like objective ways to assess people. You know, there's no scorecard that anyone, there's none of you can like look up whether I'm good at my job or not. So if another owner or team is looking to hire, how do they know if I'm good at my job or anyone? So I think like that's, that's a, that's a tough part about this job as a whole. Uh, Jackson, go ahead. Um, I was wondering if you could walk us through bringing back on the market doctrine. Yeah. Um, I would say this, like the controversial way he left was like that, you know, some, this is something I, I had to explain to like my dad for a long time, what he, what he reads and what's presented to the public versus what actually happens sometimes are two completely different stories, you know, and the, 
people whose responsibility it is to tell all the fans about what the real stories are and what's going on. Sometimes they have the right information and all the information and sometimes they have bits and pieces or sometimes there's a million different people who have some kind of motivation for painting the story a certain way, you know? So it's always very care. You always have to be very careful to say what I think is true may not actually be true. And with Chauncey, he did such a great job when he was here and, and just was like his energy and, um, you know, was, was great for us. And we enjoyed having him around, um, the way things went when he was a free agent in 23, sometimes, you know, stuff happens, things, you know, things kind of go in the wrong direction. Sometimes it's emotions. Sometimes it just is situational and timing. Um, and so I don't think like going into this free agency period, there was any lingering like, Oh, can we not bring back CJ? We know he works here. We know he, he, we know he loves football. He makes plays. And I think in this city, like if you bring in a player who is passionate, who is willing to, I mean, I feel like his spleen almost like blew up two years ago, you know, and like that, that kid, like he loves ball. And so if you're bringing in a player who wants to win in the worst way, who's super passionate about what he does, like you can't turn off the passion. The passion works both ways. So in negotiations, we only know like what we're saying and putting out there. We don't know what else is going on in the backside. So, you know, the same reasons we like him as a player probably affected how all that went and to some degree. And, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, people, relationships break up and then they get back together. Certain point, you know, like that stuff just hopefully comes together the way it's supposed to. So it speaks volumes about him too, wanting to come back. Right. I think it speaks volumes about the city as a whole and what it's like to play here. Yeah. I mean, this is players. I hear this constantly, you know, we don't do everything right. We don't win a Super Bowl every year, clearly. And sometimes it goes horribly wrong, but we always will like die trying and nothing is more important than winning. And that not just us at the team level, I mean, clearly that's the case with our fans, you know, they're going to be on our side and, you know, create hell for opposing fans. And then when things aren't going well, you know, create hell for us. But it's like that passion. Players don't want to go somewhere where it's just like the stadiums are being overtaken by visiting fans. Like I've been there on the visiting side when it's pregame warmups and you're looking around, and you're like, holy crap. It's like, you know, it's like 80% Eagles fans here or, you know, or the game the fourth quarter and it's our fans who were, you know, chanting and it's like, it's crazy. And I know that sucks for visiting, for um, home players when their stadiums are overrun. It's brutal and depressing. And that's all the more reason why players want to play here. They want to play, you know, in front of passionate fans. It's, you know, it's probably more similar to college in that sense. Um, and so I think that that matters. I think like sometimes we lose sight of the fact that the players are human. And while maybe some players want to just, you know, it's highest bidder type of thing. And it's just like, I don't care. I'll just go where they're going to pay me the most. I think by and large players are looking for the combination. They want to be paid fairly, but they want to play somewhere where everything they put into it and sacrifice is going to be appreciated and and you know that clearly is a city i mean if you do things the right way um you know you bust your ass you hustle like city loves forever mm -hmm. you know i mean it's it's crazy i i've you know the, the jason kelsey kind of journey and to see where he is now and we just i just drove by on 676 the other day there's like a billboard that says like consider this space like held for the Jason Kelsey statue or something crazy, like, you know, for a center and just, it's wild, but everybody can just feel how much he cares. And obviously he's a great player too, which doesn't hurt, but not a lot of cities where like the, the center is going to be the, 
the guy who gets the statue. Yeah. All right. Who's next? Uh, we'll go back here. Uh, what's your opinion on players that decide to rate like a new team and then changing their mind once they're that? That, for example, I'm unfortunately a Broncos fan, and we decide to lay our kicker to the Jaguars for a three year deal and then change the mind and then just re sign. What's your opinion on that? And how does someone in your position handle that or go about that? Um, I mean, I'll, yeah, I think, I think the perspective is that players are human and, and, um, like all of us or you guys will realize in your professional career at some point, money matters. Money is not the only thing. There's a lot of other factors involved. So not knowing specifics of that particular case and kind of like we just talked about with CJ, like you may make a decision that's right in that particular moment with the information you have at that time. And then as you get subsequent information, your perspective changes. And I think that's like the sign of intelligence and the sign of like smart people are that you're not going to anchor and dig in on a decision you made and just say, I'm going to make sure this is right. All right. I have new information. I'm going to reassess and I'm going to say is if my original decision is still right, cool. If it's not right and things have changed now, I'm going to make a different decision. Um, like I, I, I mean, for me, just speaking personally for myself, that seems very human. And like, I would never hold that against a player who made a decision for himself, his family, his financial welfare, whatever the case may be. Um, you know, non, yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, wow. Whoa. Uh, where are we going? Uh, let's go right here. Carrie, you go ahead. So I feel like you bring up a lot about like the player being like human and stuff. Do you ever consider like a psychologist for when you're thinking about games like that? Yeah. Like yeah. Psychiatrist. She's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> like our, our, so with a increased focus on mental health generally in society, and much more just mainstream acceptance that like physical injuries, you know, you're going to mental injuries and situations that need to be dealt with. Um, in the newest collective bargaining <laughs> agreement that we have, there's a requirement that we have a clinician in the building for a certain number of hours. Anytime we have players in the building. Um, now I think it's a testament to our clinician, that she has become such a integral part of what we do in a lot of different ways. Um, I would be almost certain that that's not the case broadly across the league. Um, but she has an incredible like sensibility. It's not like judgy, like she knows, like if you think about the skills that are required to play in the national football league and just the amount of physical abuse and what it's like, um, you need certain qualities to play in the league that maybe most people don't need in society or in their own jobs, you know? So that like level of understanding and balance is really, really important. Um, and might be hard for someone who has been educated to the extent, you know, she's a, a medical doctor. So she went through medical school. Um, it may be hard to, to have like one standard you evaluate the rest of society on and then this with players. Um, but I think, you know, it's a, a super important role at this point, um, on a team and, you know, you're not only just talking about from a mental health and like triage perspective, you're also talking about performance, you know, and the psychology of, um, improving your performance and not dwelling on negative and overcoming bad plays and like all those types of things, totally sort of separate branch of the same general discussion, but important. And yeah, I think, you know, one thing I would say organizationally is one reason why I think that amongst the 32 teams, we are one of the better organizations in the league is like each um, department, like within football operations, like we see as a, a way to, um, to have an advantage, you know, we see like competitive advantages to be had across like every department. If we're better in cap and we do better contracts, you know, our cash that we spend goes further. We have more good players. 
we say the same thing about analytics. We say the same thing about game management. We say the same thing about performance, medical, you know, any of these things, if they're done well, it's not just like, okay, we have a department, we have this department, we have this department, but are they really good? And are they better than everyone else? And I think like sort of adding up all those benefit, all those um, strategic advantages across departments is what allows teams to have a chance on a sustainable like year over year basis. You see teams that have one really good season and then sort of flame out, you know, and like that happens, you catch lightning in a bottle, but it's hard to do it year after year unless you're really hitting on all these cylinders and, um, you know, sustaining that way. All right. Wow. Right here. Mm. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I don't know. That's a, a that's a really good question because I think what that opens up is a whole litany of other like things. My daughter's here, so if I went down this other path, would this still be my daughter? I don't know. Like that's crazy to think about. Would I be married to my wife? Would I be living in this house? Um, but I think everything happens for a reason. I do think though that um, I probably wish that I had a little bit better. Um, perspective or I was a little bit more real with myself or self-aware at the time um, because I think I would have probably made some different decisions but I also am very like just life-wise and I've said it I think a few times but I think like rethinking a certain process is is great and healthy behavior rethinking decisions when you know that with the information you had at your disposal at that point, like you made such and such a decision. Like, I think that's pointless and is actually self-defeating and, you know, can make you crazy if you're just sitting there. I wish I would have done this. Well, you know, I didn't obviously have compelling reasons to do it. So like, what's the point? Rather than think to myself, like, where did I, where was the mistake here? Or where did I miss, did I miss information I could have had or something like that? So. I don't know. Now I'm just, you know, here trying to prevent the rest of you guys from making mistakes or, you know, from at least learning from what I did. Okay. Very good. Uh, let's see. Who has asked for it? Go ahead, Sam. Okay. So as a giant, actually, I'm not going to ask for a big one. I'm a little disappointed. But I think it's best for you guys. And so what's your role when a trade goes down in the NFL? I'm a particular leader. Uh-huh. Um, so... It depends, I would say, um, but my role typically um, is we've talked about a particular situation. We've talked about potential trades. Um, it really just kind of depends on time of year, what we're talking about, how complicated it is, whether we're talking about players, um, you know, with contracts involved, whether we're talking about like during the draft, you know, pick for pick and stuff like that. Um, but my role really is just to help if I have value to add in terms of we're thinking about, you know, trading, um, whatever the case may be, my role, I see it as like, when it comes to talking about some type of strategic thing, what I do in terms of cap or is not really important. What's important is, are you bringing like good, helpful information to the table? And is, is this going to affect um, what we decide in a particular thing? So there's certain times where it's like, I don't know, I don't care. You know, like it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. And we won't know until we're way down the road whether this was good or bad. There's other times where I may have a perspective, we're going to trade for a player. I know someone who says he's this, that, or the other, you know, like certain things. Um, but mainly it's just to contribute if I have something to contribute. And then when we finally, when we do agree, um, I consider part of my job as a teammate to be shut the F up about whatever my perspective was before, you know, whether I was against whatever we were going to do, or I thought there were reasons not to do it. Once we've decided to do it, it does nobody any good to just sit there and just remind everyone that you didn't want to do this, or you can't stand this player or whatever the case may be. So my role is to be supportive and jump on and you know, rally around it. And then there's paperwork, trade papers that need to be done, language that needs to be crafted to reflect 
know, sometimes there's like contingencies and terms and things like that that needs to be right. Um, so go back and forth with a counterpart at the other team, make sure we all agree on the terminology and papers, then those get signed and submitted to the league and, you know. Are you dealing stuff. with the cap as well? Uh, are you trying to, is that your, on how trades? we then expect, yeah, or mm -hmm. on a trade or, yeah. or on, a, on a signing We're, of a player, they're, they're expecting you okay, can we figure, can we slot this in here? Is Correct. this going to work? All yeah, that. and we're planning, you know, I think like we are constantly balancing the short term and the longer term. We always want it, you know, we are never pushing our chips in the middle and saying, if we don't win this year, we're screwed for the next three years. That's unacceptable. Um, so there's always a, like a balance of, you know, where does this put us now? And then does this put us at a huge disadvantage a year from now? Or how are we going to solve that? Um, it's never going to be just like, yeah, we'll figure that out when we get to it. Like that's not acceptable either. You know, I always like anything that we do or that I have a role in, I'm sitting there to myself thinking, doesn't matter who, if Jeffrey walked in, if Howie walks in and says, why did we do this? That it's not just like my response isn't, mm, I don't know, <laughs> you know, or like that there's a compelling reason or I know exactly why. And, a lot of times, like in these negotiations, an agent will be like, ah, come on, what, you know, what does it matter? We're talking about a few thousand dollars. We're talking about whatever the case may be. It might be 25,000, 50,000, 100,000, depends on what you're negotiating, but that may seem like a rounding error. And so the technique is like to just try to get you to throw a bunch of other crap in because it seems like it's tiny, but you know, the, the reality is, and I say this is like, everything that we spend extra that we didn't have to on a player prevents us from spending on another player who may help us. And there needs to be the same rationale, you know, for everything we do. Okay. Uh, let's take two more. Okay. Go ahead. Right here. Um, I was talking about trade, but I feel like there's a disconnect between how the NFL front office might value a player versus like how the fan base needs to take that player to be valued. Like, you know, they have a former all pro go for a fourth round pick. Mm -hmm. so I just wanted, like, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I think one thing about the NFL is because it is a like a asset constrained sport where every team theoretically is starting with the exact same assets, right? We have a salary cap, so theoretically we're all capped on what we can spend on players. We all start at some point from with the same picks. Um, so every single thing we do, there's a balance between the on-field benefit now, what's gonna happen in the longer term, and then what's the impact on us financially? Like, how does this impact another player we might need to bring in, or a couple other players, or... Um, so, contract length, when a player is on the last year of his deal, um, that obviously, when you're trading for him, could be a positive, could be a negative. Um, how much that player makes. Typically, the more the player makes, the harder it is to get a lot back in trade compensation because, you know, there is a cash value of sorts to picks, right? When you draft a player, you're getting every drafted player signs a four year contract. So if you hit on a pick and you get a good player, you know, from a cost certainty perspective, exactly what you're going to pay him for the next four years. And if it's a really good player, you, every single time you're paying less than what he would get in the market. So there's a huge competitive advantage to having really good draft picks on good contracts that are making less money. It's easier to pay other players. Um, so in trades, uh, like you know, draft grades, free agency grades in the media, um, and then even like perceptions on trades um, are largely dictated by like brand name recognition on a player. When, when fans have heard of a player or a player's been to a Pro Bowl and, or things like that, um, or when we sign a bunch of players in free agencies that people have heard of, or when teams drafts correlate really closely to mock drafts and where they thought players would go, or when they pick players better than where they were in mocks, everyone thinks that that's great. You know, but I, but the considerations are a little bit different on the other side. That doesn't always take everything into account. You know, in a salary cap league like we have, 
um, every time we add a player at a certain cost, it there's an opportunity cost where now we can't do something else. So I think that's it. Like you see that a lot in the NFL, like players go for later round picks or pick swaps or, and fans are like, oh my God, this guy's a great player. Well, it may be a bad contract, you know, may only be a one-year contract. Now you've given up picks where you would have four years of, of contract life on that. And so there's a big cost to give those things up. Particularly if that guy's a quarterback. I mean, yeah. Brock Purdy worked out pretty well for San Francisco. Correct. Yeah. But, so. yeah. but I think it's also like when it comes to the draft, being um, aware of what the success rates are by round and how that drops off and, and everything is, is really important. Like those are lottery tickets. All right. Last question. Let's see. Uh, you know what, Seth? I'm going to give you the last question. Congratulations. There you go. So when you made the switch from training to the NFL, Um, it was a difficult transition um, because there is a lot of um, there's not a lot of like people who are going to hold your hand and show you stuff necessarily um, and is that because they don't want to help you no not necessarily but everyone's busy and has their own jobs and and I'd also say like you're not typically it depends but at a certain level, you're not necessarily being hired into a mentored situation where someone is there who has been doing the job, who's just going to like make this transition super easy for you. Um, so having pivoted a few times um, and, you know, maybe pivoting again at some point, like being able to, like I said, I was terrible at foreign languages, but I have pivoted, like each time you pivot, you need to learn a new language in a sense. Like I'm not good at French, but I am good at pivoting apparently and like just throwing myself into something and learning that language and becoming like endemic in that. So I think that's really it. I feel like I'm gonna get like- No, go ahead. No, dude, I don't wanna, I'm just gonna put this- um, So you, you learn stuff. It's not like it just all of a sudden, you know, you go from like just starting to being a, a genius at whatever you're doing. It takes time and it's an evolving process. Am I supposed to get up now? <laughs> you like the little curtain yeah. thing, eh? I don't know. It's there you go. There you go. No, but so, so, but that was, I mean, uh, and we'll wrap it up in this way. The transition that you had to make, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a massive, massive change. Massive change. And now, you know, 12, 13 years later, you, you, you survived it. And, and yeah. you're still in the business. I am. But always trying to figure out what's next. And I think like the one thing that I would leave everybody with that, that um, my career has definitely taught me is like, you need to take ownership of your own life and career and constantly be the one who is figuring out if what you're doing is putting you on the path that you want to be on, whether it's you know, how that relates to your family, how that relates to being a good person, you, what you're doing day to day in your job, whether you're learning, like all those things, because no one's going to do that for, for you. So just because something checked all the boxes and, you know, passed that test five years ago or last year or a month ago doesn't necessarily mean it always will. And so for better or worse, I always do that. And that's probably why I've, you know, switched twice and um, have all these stories to tell. But I think that that ultimately is, is a good trade, not a bad. Let's give a round of applause. Jake Rosenberg, thank you so much for being here. Let me just remind everybody that next week we've got Marquise Watson, uh, the Spring Hill Company. Who knows about it? Spring Hill Company. That's LeBron James and Maverick Carter's company. Marquise works for them. So he's a terrific speaker. Work for the Sixers and Corporate Partnership as well. Uh, but he will be joining us next week uh, to talk about. Also, he works with a lot of uh, he works with a lot of young people and mentoring. So I think he's going to be a fabulous guest here next week. So we'll see you then. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jake.